Hello and welcome to a video on composite functions. So we're looking here at a graphical illustration of what a composite function might be. So look at the top function, it's called g, and look at the shape of the inputs of this function um, and their spheres, right? And the bottom function is f. Now the shape of the inputs for the bottom function are cubes. So if you think of a function as a machine, literally a machine, and don't think of it, first of all, at least as a mathematical um, thing, don't even think about it with numbers or variables, just think about it with shapes. What's happening here is that the first machine turns spheres into cubes. Now cubes go nicely into the second machine, and then the second machine turns them into something else. Okay, so one mathematical example of this could be something like, um, let's say that f of x were the square root of x. Okay, let's say that f of x were the square root of x. Now in that machine, negative numbers can't go in there, right? You, you can't compute the square root of negative number. However, let's say that g of x were the absolute value. Now you could put pretty much any number into g of x. It would turn it into a positive number. That positive number would go into f of x and you'd be able to get an output. So this is sort of an example of how composites can look like with equations. But before we look at them with equations, we're just going to try to get uh, an idea of the general meaning of composite functions with uh, graphs, with um, some tables of numbers, and first a definition, first another, another visual. So let's say that you have an input, and the input goes through one function, let's call it g, like we have illustrated over here, and you get an output, right, called g of x. Now that output becomes a new input, and that input goes into the second function called f, and the output, we call that f of g of x. Now there's the, one of the notations of composite functions. That's the most common notation. So now we can also think of this as its own function. So we can think of something going in the composed functions all the way to give you an output, all right, as long as x is defined for the inner function. Now that's what happens over here too. If you think of that square root and absolute value example, you can't take g of f of x. You, you couldn't do it the other way around because then you wouldn't have, um, you wouldn't have, it, it wouldn't be defined the same way, right? And then you'd have something, you could, wouldn't be able to put a negative number into that f of x. Okay, so we also can call this um, the circle function. It's just an alternative notation, f circle g. All right, so what is a composite function? First of all, the notation, we would say f circle g of x. Sometimes you see that f circle g in parentheses so that it doesn't look like it's uh, you know not together. And that is the same thing as f of g of x. Okay, and it's this is basically the combining of functions in such a way that the output of the inner function, so the output of the inner function g, its output, becomes the input of the outer function. And the first time you hear that, it sounds like a very long sentence, but it's going to get shorter and shorter because you're going to hear it a lot. All right, so it's a function where, and you can see it right here, you have an input to the, this would, g would be the um, inner function. You have the input to the inner function the output to the inner function, the cube, becomes the input to the outer function. All right, and here you can see it here, f is the outer function. So our notation in this example is consistent with the diagram. All right, I'm going to write that long sentence down. Okay, so there's the meaning of a composite of functions. Now let's look at this from a graphical perspective first. So we're looking at a graph, and the graph has two functions. The blue function here is called f of x. The red function is called g of x. And so we want to find f of g of 1. So what we need is we need to first find the output of g of 1. So we look at g, which is, again, the red function, where the input is 1. So we're looking here where the input is 1, and we get an output that just happens to be on the intersection. That's just not intentional. It just happens to be. But the output there is 3. So g of 1 is 3. That means we're looking for f of 3, because the output of the inner function, g, becomes the input of the outer function, f. And now we're looking at the function f, and we're looking for f of 3, 
So we're looking at 1, 2, 3, and f is way up here, and that's at, it looks like, 9. So that means f of g of 1 equals 9. Okay, let's try another one. So let's now look at g of f of 1. It looks almost the same, but it's in a different order. So this time the inner function is f, and I'm looking for the output when the input to f is 1. And that happens to be the same place. That's what we saw in the last one, right? When x is 1, the output to f is right there. It's 3. So this is 3. But this time we're looking for g of 3. So g of 3 means we look over here at 1, 2, 3, and we're looking all the way down here, and we get to negative 5. So g of 3 looks like negative 5. Okay? Let's try another one. So this time we're looking for g of f of negative 1. So f of negative 1. So we look at the f function, that's the blue one. We look at negative 1, and we've got that point right there. It has an output of negative 3. That output now becomes the input of g, the outer function. So g of negative 3. Now we're looking at the g function, that's the parabola, at negative 3. So negative 1, 2, 3, and it's all the way down here, again, at negative 5. Okay, why don't you pause the video and try the next one. Okay, so we got g. Now, it looks weird, right? g of g of 2, what does that mean? Well, first, the inner function is g of 2. So we look for the output of when the input is 2 of the g function, and we get 0, right? At g equals 2, it's right there. The output is 0. So then that becomes the input of the outer function, which is also g. It's okay. It's the same function, but it's okay. It's going to be a different output. g of 0 is 4. All right, let's look at, uh, let's move on from um, graphs to tables. So let's look at a table. So this time the inner function is, is um, the g for, the, for a. This is the g function. So if the input is 52, it's right there. Right? It's part of the g function. And the output, when the input is 52, says it's, it's 9. So g of 52 is 9. So the next question would be, well, what's f of 9? And so now we look at the f table, and we've got the input of 9, and the output is 84. So that's f of g of 52. Okay, try the next one. Pause the video and try it. Okay, so there you go. So we have f of 1 is 4 and g of 4 is 3. So the final answer is 3. Now the next two are going to, we're going to run into some problems in these two. And there's two different kinds of problems that you can run into. Let's just think about the definition for one minute. Um, we want the output of the inner function. So that assumes that whatever we put into the inner function is defined. That's number one. But number two, it assumes that that output to the inner function will be defined for the outer function. And in the example I gave you up here, I said if these two were switched, you could run into trouble. Because if you take, um, if you put the f of x first, you might have an input that's undefined. You could have a negative number, for example. But we're going to see these two situations happen in the next example. So if it's, if it's confusing how that can happen, hopefully this will make sense. So the first one, we're looking for g of 18. So g of 18. So we look at the g function. That's this one. And we do have an 18 there. So that is defined, and then it equals 6, right? So that means when now we need f of 6. So we look at the f function, and we see that there is no 6. That it goes from 5 to 7, and there's no 6 there. So this is simply undefined. That's one of the two ways that you can get a composite of functions that's undefined. The other way is just right at the beginning. So right at the beginning, the first thing that we need to find for part D here is f of 18. And when we look at the f function, we see that there is no definition. We don't know what happens. And we're not trying to look for a pattern here. The, the implication here is that this is the entire function. So this isn't about an equation that has these inputs and what will be the next numbers. That's not what this is about. This is just about you're looking at an entire function. The domain is just these five numbers. The range is just these five numbers. And 18 is just not in the domain. So therefore, this is undefined. And it's not that big of a deal, but I really don't like to say 
equals undefined. It just doesn't really make sense, so I just put a colon there. Okay? Now, finally, we get to look at this with equations. So let's look at this as um, two equations. We're given f of x and g of x as equations, and we're going to find um, f of g of 1. So it's really the same thing. We're going to start out with the inner function and start out with g of 1. So g of 1, we look at the g function, and it's going to be 4 times 1 cubed plus 1, and that simplifies to 5. That becomes the input of the outer function, which is f. So now we're looking for f of 5. The f function is 2 times 5 squared plus 3. That's 2 times 25 is 50, plus 3 is 53. Okay, why don't you try the next one? Pause the video. Remember that g circle f means g of f of 1. So this is really just g of f of 1. Okay, pause the video. Okay, so f of 1 was 5, g of 5 is 501. That's your answer. All right, now the next example, we're going to look at f of f of negative 2 in two different methods. And method 2 is actually the one that we've been working with. So let's go ahead and do method 2 first, even though it's the second one. It doesn't matter. So we're going to find f of negative 2 first. So f of negative 2 is um, 2 times negative 2 squared plus 3 which gives us an output of 2 times 4, that's 8, plus 3 is 11. So that output will now become the input of the outer function, which is also f. So we're going to find f of 11 now, which is 2 times 11 squared plus 3. 11 squared is 121. 2 times 121 is 242. Add 3 and you get 245. That's the first method, and that's probably the easier method. The second method has something else to offer, though, and that is to actually plug the function in first and find a new function. So we're going to first find f of f of x. In other words, I'm going to find f of, and I'm going to make my input 2x squared plus 3. That's what f of x is. That's going to be my input. That's going to go into the function. So my function now will be, I think I'm going to do this with color so you can see it very clearly. Okay, so I'm going to make this, this is the input, is 2x squared plus 3, and that is equal to 2x squared plus 3, but my input is 2x squared plus 3. It's not necessarily the easier way to think about it, but it's worth understanding. Okay, so what does this simplify to? This simplifies to um, 2 times 2x squared plus 3 times itself. And that's then plus 3. And then when we multiply all that out, we're going to get 8x to the 4th. I've already done this. You might need another step, but I'm just kind of showing it here. 24x squared plus 21. And that is f of f of x. Okay, I just multiplied this stuff out. All right, so now the question would be, what's f of f of negative 2? Well, now that we have a function, I'm going to squeeze it right underneath here so you can see it. f of f of negative 2 would just be 8 times, I'll put this in blue, negative 2 to the 4th plus 24 times negative 2 squared plus 21. And when we multiply all that out, I hope we're going to get the same thing. We get 8 times uh, 16, 2, 4, 8, 16, plus 24 times 4, plus 21, and that is 245. Okay, I hope you found this video helpful. Um, we'll make an, a part 2 for this last example.